Hey guys, it's Christy Gordon here and today we're heading into Museum Mile to check out an exhibition by Florine Stettheimer at the Jewish Museum called Painting Poetry. Oh wow, well we're starting out with probably my favorite painting. This is an amazing painting. It's Family Portrait 2, 1933, oil on canvas, 46 inches by 64 inches. And Florine Stettheimer was born in Rochester, New York in 1871 to a wealthy German-Jewish family. And when she was young, her um, dad abandoned the family. And so her mom and her three sisters and one brother all moved to Europe to be closer to her mother Rosetta's family. And while she was there, she was exposed to a lot of the modern art that was going on in Paris and Munich, and she also traveled to Italy. And, um, and so a lot of her work is really bringing together a lot of different influences um, into this really unique style that this piece here is really emblematic of. And right here you see a depiction of her mother in black lace, um, one of Florine's favorite fabrics. And she's enclosed in sort of a shell-like structure. And I really like the elongated figures and um, stylization to the figure that she uses. And she's got a lot of interesting textures. You can see she's even using some like scratching, you know, and like the palette knife. She's got these smooth, polished, flat, flat, smooth areas like the white there next to these super impasto textured areas and scribbly sort of depictions to represent the lace and um, the hugely impastoed fronds on the flowers here. Um, just really thickly impastoed. And so this show of her work really shows the progress that her work took and, and the way um, that she developed her style. So near the end of the 19th century, she traveled back to New York briefly to study at the Art Students League and got some really academic training there, um, doing academic drawing and studying. And here's an early work of her sister Carrie that was done in a sort of sergeant, John Singer Sargent-ish type of style. And here's probably a slightly later work titled Family Portrait One, done in 1915, oil on canvas, and it's 40 by 62 inches. And you can see the beginning influence of post-impressionism here, um, kind of reminiscent of like Van Gogh, or you know, and then just certain textures that are similar to some of the post-impressionists. And next to these early works, they've got a cluster of later works. This is Portrait of My Teacher, Fraulein Sophie von Preisser, done in 1929, oil on canvas. And you can see the way her style progressed and became really unique to her with these bold shapes. Here's Portrait of My Mother done in 1925, 38 by 26 inches. And the shape that she simplified her mother's dress and the sort of pointy tip of the shoe into creating this kind of pointy oval type of shape reminds me of the way like some Renaissance artists would sometimes use the drapery in the figure of Mother Mary to really represent like the womb. And next to that, we've got portrait of my aunt done in 1928 oil on canvas and I'm really liking the design equality in the patterning on her dress and the super black dress next to the white light pink sort of background some parts are scratched into to create some textures and the redness in the figure's face details is really interesting and look at that arm the simplification it's almost just like a big hook And then in this next room, we've got some designs that Florine did that were um, after she had seen the Ballet Ruses, a Russian ballet in Paris, and she was really inspired by them. And actually lots of other artists were 
too, including people like Dega. And she um, was really influenced by them and began designing her own ballet back in New York. And that's what this section is. It's her designs of costumes and things for a ballet, which she had actually hoped would be performed when the Ballet Ruses actually visited New York. I believe it was in 1916. Um, and she was actually really disappointed when, you know, they didn't end up performing her ballet. Um, and yeah, it's really great to see this, the gestural style of these drawings and the imagination. A lot of sort of symbolist influences and I like the combining of textures, like actually using fur and like, and this gauzy sort of material, which she really loved those kind of materials. And, you know, she paints images of them. And here she is in like using black lace, like actually glued on to the blue panel backgrounds. It's like really um, embracing the feminine sort of materials um yeah and that image of the snake wrapping around like a female definitely seems like something i've seen in some symbolist art the beading on there and uh the really stylized figures i love this one i think it's so fun i like the pink and the blue and the gauzy fabrics and it's just so interesting. I love the pink next to that blue. That's one of my favorite combinations right now. And the beading is really interesting. And so it's neat to see her exploring this, you know, these other mediums and getting a similar kind of feel to her voice. I love unicorns and this fancy fluffy unicorn is so neat. I think it's got some silver uh, little flowers drawn on it here and the actual puffs of fur is really neat. And so I believe it was in reading Linda Nochlin's article about Florine Stettheimer where she talks about the way that Florine embraces these sort of feminine materials and feminine modes of expression in work um, that does have an awareness about like gender roles and um, you know a certain level of feminism in the work and it's interesting because there's a history to female artists who are feminists um, embracing these modes of expression that seem really feminine using uh, feminine materials and and imagery and so forth in their art so it's cool to see that happening in Florine's work and here's a painting titled Heat done in 1919, oil on canvas 50 inches by 36 inches. And the title Heat, it's also relating to this idea of synesthesia in the work. So the idea that one sense can sort of produce another sense. Um, and so like the reds and the oranges here can also produce like the sensation of heat in our body. And what that means, what that sort of brings to mind for me is also the book, um, The Art of Spiritual Harmony, that Kandinsky wrote, which um, talks a lot about color and its effects. And, and in it, he was talking about the use of the color red, um, and red being a color that has this energy in it that vibrates within itself. It doesn't really move forward or back. Like he says, you know, the yellow and blue, um, yellow moves forward and black, uh, blue moves backwards but the red just sort of vibrates in and of itself and um, so I thought that was interesting and and also looking at this piece here titled self-portrait with palette painter and fawn undated oil on canvas 59 inches by 71 inches for me it brings to mind um, other artists and Roberta Smith the art critic of the New York Times was talking about this too when she saw the show that the way that Florine's dealing with color and figuration in her, her work reminds Roberta Smith of a lot of other contemporary, a lot of them female artists that are dealing with similar types of concerns in their art right now. And, and the strong use of red in this painting reminds me of someone like Jenny Morgan, who I really love. 
And while I was at this show, there was a lot of tour guides going through, and uh, here's just a quick clip of what I heard one of them talking about. I want you to notice how she uses this Chinese white pigment. She lathers it on the canvas to begin with. So it builds up, there's almost a relief, and it has a, an effervescence, like a mother of pearl uh, quality to it. And that white, like in the portrait of her sister when I pointed out the white, animates the canvas. It lights up the canvas. It gives life to the canvas. Now, follow me. Look how she connects herself to the fawn. And who danced the role of the fawn? Nijinsky. The greatest dancer of all time. Is she not saying, I'm not a great artist as well? Look. Red shoes, to the red palette, to the red brush, to the red... I feel like this piece, Picnic at Bedford Hills, done in 1918, uh, 40 inches by 50 inches, is kind of like one of her transitional pieces that starts to bridge um, her work that was a bit more post-impressionist and starts to edge towards the new style that she's developing and becomes known for you can see like the increasing use of white and um, and the spacing of the figures, the lack of perspective, um, and and these strong reds with little bits of textured details, um, both in the brushwork, little lines and dots, and also with palette knife like thick impastos next to some sort of flatter areas. And so as we enter this room, this room really is the room that shows the progression from her work, um, where she really starts to fully find her style and her voice over a period of about six years. And it wasn't just like by chance that she like happened upon this style. She was really well versed in um, everything to do with art. Um, after her death, her sister Eddie, who was a writer, wrote about Florine that Florine had probably read everything that there was written about art in English, French, and German. So she was like really well versed in art. She was bringing together a lot of different sources of inspiration. And she was also consciously turning away from a lot of other different possibilities like her classical training um, that she started with and like things like Cubism or Dadaism which was really popular at the time and she was friends with people like Marcel Duchamp who was uh, a big part of that movement. And I really like the way a lot of her more developed work later in her life uh, really incorporates this use of like line next to like large flat bodies of color um, and seems reminiscent sometimes of people like Chagall, sometimes even of like Matisse and Miro, and even sometimes things like the um, illustrations that were probably being seen in like Vanity Fair at the time. And here's a painting of Marcel Duchamp um, with his alter ego, the female um, persona. And She's really playing with like flatness and space and line and shape and um, and d design and like these abstractions of the figure and pattern too. This painting, Portrait of Louise Boucher, nineteen twenty three, twenty eight by eighteen inch, really shows like her use of the flat color of the blue with like the textured pattern like thick impasto of the whites and this is called Portrait of Henry McBride done in 1922 30 inches by 26 inches and I love the rainbow in the background there and all of the use of white and the flattening of space um, the way she's like depicting these small sort of aerial shots of like the fence and and the lines of this fence here was actually done in part by scratching in the lines rather than painting them in. Here's a painting of Marcel Duchamp. I'm not really supposed to photograph this one but here she's almost prophetizing his role in the art world. Um, he almost looks like a godlike figure here with the radiating beams of brush strokes coming out of his head. 
And I am completely in love with this painting on the left here, um, titled Portrait of Myself. And I love this weird sort of fiery sofa lounge thing that she's on, or cloak or whatever it's, it is. And the red details for her eyes and mouth and that sun. And then she's written her name here with thick white paint, almost like cake icing coming out of a cake decorator. Um, and this painting titled Portrait of My Sister Carrie, I found a sketch for it, a watercolor sketch, which you see on the side. And it's interesting to see the artist's process. I love these rainbow curtains. And yeah, just the um, small details of black, the little lines of the legs of that house thing, and the lines, almost like antennas in her hat, and then that flattening of space with the detailing of the distant grounds. Really interesting elongation of shapes and these sort of S-curves. Here's another image of her reclining on a red chair, sort of like the portrait of myself one. Um, these orbs at the bottom really remind me of like symbolism. And we've got a thickly impasted Christmas tree beside her and, and it looks like it's on fire. And I'm not really supposed to film this one, it's called New York Liberty done in 1918 and 1919 and it's 62 inches by 44 inches so I found an image of it on the internet and what's hard to tell from any images that you see rather than when you see it in life is that the gold statue of Liberty on the left there is super heavily gilded like it's like two inches thick sticking off from the surface of the painting it's really interesting and the New York like buildings in the background there just done with lines it's really designy and this is a painting that people have started to talk about how although it seems like a lot of the images that she's using are just like images taken from her daily life like her and her sisters and their house and things like that they're interesting because they can also act as allegories for things that were going on like politically and larger issues at the time. So this painting depicts like battleships in the a harbor at New York and um, done in 1918, it can seem to reflect her arrival back into New York in 1914 um, at the beginning of World War One, just before World War One. Um, her and her sisters and mom moved back to New York from Europe and and then it can also act as like an allegory for like America's late entry into World War One in 1917 and with the fact that it commemorates her arrival to New York in 1914 it's also interesting with the Americanism that it's portraying with like the American flag and the Statue of Liberty and this great city and almost like the promise of a great life but the question like is that tr really true it, it's like a fantasy you know the city looks um, kind of like a parade float or like a cake decoration so she's playing with fantasy and Americanism in an interesting way and here's an absolutely exquisite piece that really brings to mind for me like some Japanese prints um, with that use of line and the empty spaces and then the shapes, the kind of pointy interesting shapes of color. Um, it also brings to mind like Miro even with the lines and colored shapes like red and, and Matisse too. And these droop, droopy sort of fringy um, feminine sort of trees with the pinks and the um, light pastel blues and then this hot red figure and there she is reclining on um, you know a nice frilly white bed the pastel pinks and blues next to these dots are interesting and then the areas of brighter colors and distinct shapes pointy little feet and pointy fringes and then this impasto texture and the whites it's really interesting. These dots here remind me of Thomas Troche, an artist that I saw in New York last month. 
and yeah just the the interesting pointy curvy linear shapes that she's using and the lines um the textures in like the tree trunk almost seem a bit glittery and this is a room that shows her mature work with her fully developed style uh, very recognizable uh, many of them done in the 1920s and she's really worked out her voice and her style at this point she's working large complex compositions and this painting titled Spring Sale at Bendel's done in 1921 50 inches by 40 inches this is almost like a battle scene in the spring sale with all of the women fighting over the sales and the unhappy looking sales clerk standing by the side. But also stylistically, it's an interesting combination of um, things like the, van you know, illustrations in Vanity Fair or um, other like fashion illustrations um, combined with modern art tropes like the lines and shapes of Matisse and the flattening out of space and um, the textures in the paint and the kind of white background with these floating you know spaces um, uh, these bodies of color and, and circles and you know just sort of geometric and organic floating shapes of color on this flat non three-dimensional space and none of her figures really seem that grounded they're all kind of teetering on these tippy toe little pointy feet um, kind of like ballerina shoes maybe influenced by the ballet russes We've got a little dog sitting here at the very bottom corner. Well, this is a gorgeous piece. It's called Birthday Bouquet Flowers with a Snake, done in 1932, and it's 30 by 26 inches. And for me, these flowers definitely bring to mind Georgia O'Keeffe, who was one of her friends. And flowers have been something that You've seen a lot of female artists embrace. Um, sometimes it's even like a symbol of like a female, um, like in the work of Georgia O'Keeffe. And I feel like the colors and some of the subject matter in Florian Stettheimer's work are kind of like taking what's traditionally associated with female and even sometimes even with more like lower forms of art um, similar to the idea of female artists like embracing the use of like what's sometimes considered craft and creating like high art out of it sort of playing with the bounds the boundaries between high art and low art here's another gorgeous scene with really nice pastel colors. This is called Lake Placid done in 1919 and it's 40 inches by 50 inches. And yeah, I'm just loving the pastel green with the soft pink in these background mountains and then the strong accents of little bits of color like the red and the blues and the figures. And I like that impasto and the white wave and the way that the figures are sort of simplified into just all one color almost gives like a really nice strong silhouette to the figures beauty contest is a really interesting piece done in 1924 uh, 50 inches by 60 inches and here she's really um, playing with ideas of gender and race and Americanism and she's got everyone separated into their own little compartment um, each person is playing their role. We've got a Miss Atlantic City, and there's Florine on the left there with the black hair. Um, beauty contest contestants, and um, everyone's separated by these frilly, frondy, liney things. And it's kind of like a satire of a beauty contest. Red, white, and blue, really American colors on the horse, and. 
um, these roughly frilly decorations are really feminine and and cake-like. I always think the white impastos are kind of cake-like too, like icing, and this prancy horse and and the guy beside the horse with these little tippy toes. And I love all the curtainy, drapey framing devices and these dripping crystal balls along the top. It makes it all very theatrical. And this is a key piece of hers, Asbury Park South, done in 1920, oil on ca canvas, 50 inches by 60 inches. And this is a depiction of a segregated beach that caused a lot of controversy in the 1920s. Um, we've got some African-American figures just beautifully dressed, enjoying the beach. There's Florine with the green umbrella and black hair watching the scene, and Marcel Duchamp in the pinkish red jacket there with his partner at the bottom, and really interesting elongated stylized figures. This overlooker um, in the black suit here is Carl Van Vechten, a key figure in the Harlem Renaissance and someone who had brought Florine to this beach. Apparently this was actually one of Florine's favorite pieces. At least it's the piece that she entered into the most um, exhibitions and contests. Here we've got Christmas 1930 to 1940 done um, 60 inches by 40 inches. And the style does have a certain illustrative quality and a nice flattening out of space really designy elements with the detailing. Are these like a string of bears skating around the tree or something? Um, and it's a Christmas tree in Central Park. I like her depiction of statues in a lot of her pieces. And then these flat sort of set-like backgrounds. And the really thick use of impasto and palette knife really like globbing the paint on for some of these tinselly Christmas tree ornaments. And the swan ride. I love the reds and the hair and the face and the dots for the fur next to these thin little details for the bench. And the use of line in that woman's coat. These thin spindly details in the architecture next to the great big mass of the ice rink is a nice contrast. And that palette knife applied snow on the roof is neat. So what a great show. That's Florine Stedheimer at the Jewish Museum. The show is just ending here and it's going up to the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario, next. I think it's opening in October of 2017 there. Of course, you won't be able to take any photos in that show, unfortunately, so I'm so happy to have been able to take you guys in with video and take a bunch of reference photos for myself here at this show.